Hello, Ed. Hello, Dr. Laffer. We, How we, are you, sir? Good. We're, we're live. Oh, um, my God. I've been tap dancing for a while. I have been alive for 83 years. <laughs> well, thank you very much for uh, joining us. I, I appreciate it very much. It is my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, it's been a while since we've talked last. Um, 21, 20, what was it? Yeah, it was 2021, but we used to talk a lot more frequently when uh, on Fox Business. Oh, yes, of course. But um, so we have we have a lot of people and I, I wanted to uh, one, I wanted to let people know that they can ask questions and they can uh, throw those through um, my um, on my chat. But at the same time, um, I wanted to ask you a few questions myself. I don't know what that buzzing is. It's not us. OK, so um, so everybody, this is Dr. Art Laffer, you know, the world's most famous economist uh, was the uh, part of the economic policy for uh, Ronald Reagan from 81 to 89 and is known for the Laffer curve, uh, which we're going to talk a little bit about. But today, Dr. Laffer, we had the Fed funds rate pause, basically the, the, ra the raising of it. What, what is your thoughts on that? Do you think that the Fed has done a good job of taming inflation? No, I don't think it has. Uh, they've violated everything since Paul Volcker, if I may say. Now, this Fed, by the way, didn't start the bad policies. The bad policy started in 2007, 2008, 2009, when they decided to control interest rates. Paul Volcker always followed interest rates and let the market determine what the rates are. And then he moved the discount rate to follow the market. So they moved together. Uh, but uh, the prime interest rate in, uh, in, in 1981 on January 20th, when we took office, was 21.5%. This Fed has done everything to hold interest rates down. They've used price controls instead of allowing the market to determine what interest rates are. And that has had very deleterious effects on the economy. What it's done is it's held interest rates artificially low. Now, the way they did that was by buying bonds uh, in the open market to bid the price of the bonds up to keep those interest rates down. And that has allowed them to expand the balance sheet of the Fed, I think, to almost $9 trillion. I, I may, it may be $8 trillion, but whatever it is, it's way up there. That's the only way they've gotten to be able to hold those interest rates down. What it's gotten is the market addicted to very low interest rates, which it should not have been during this recent period of inflation, during any of these periods and held those rates down, which means that all the banks, if they want to seek any type of return on their assets, have to take well themselves way out in maturity. All right, they have to hold assets that are very long. That's the only place you're going to find any yield at all. And of course, all of their liabilities are very short, as you know. Mm -hmm. So whenever interest rates now start returning to normal uh, by rising, of course, what it does is it causes uh, huge, uh, the portfolio of long-term assets drops dramatically. And of course, the liabilities uh, now have to pay higher. So you have this uh, this uh, huge credit crunch, which you've seen in the banks being taken over and all of that. And how we ever return to free market banking, I don't know. Uh, but the Fed, I think, has done a very bad job since 2007, 2008, 2009 by trying to control interest rates. Markets should be allowed to determine where interest rates are. And then the Fed should follow those markets with a discount rate because the discount rate is there if, if a bank, a specific bank, has a problem with uh, excess reserves or not enough reserves, then they can borrow from the discount window to build their reserves up. That discount window should be at a penalty rate, a little bit above the market rate, uh, to make sure that they get, guide their reserves properly. But that's not the way it's anymore. It's no more... Uh, Walter Badgett, there's no more Walter Badgett, there's no more free markets in this. You know, in, in Badgett times in the 19th century, it was in times of crisis, discount freely. Well, this bank has been, this Fed has been discounting freely for 10, 12 years. There's no crisis. And so they've created a banking system that has got the banks off their proper behavior. And it's, uh, it, has a, it has a very deleterious effect on the long term growth of the US. So the M2, which is the uh, money supply. When I, I've, I'm, again, I'm, I'm not 
you know, an economist. No, no, I, I understand. And I'm not going to take you and I'm not going to criticize you from anything you say. I will okay. not. Criticize. I'll try to give you my wrong answers and replace your right answers with my <laughs> wrong answers. OK, but no, no. M2 is not the money supply. It is not. Who is not. The Fed does not control M2. The Fed controls the monetary base, and that is it. Uh, and M2 conclude, includes the demand for money. I had these battles with Milton Friedman all the way through the whole Reagan era when the money supply, Milton Friedman says, was growing very rapidly. And I said, it's not the money supply that's growing very rapidly. It's the demand for money that's increasing very rapidly during the 80s because of uh, Reagan's very good tax cuts, strong growth economic policies, the transactions demand for money was increasing enormously. Interest rates were falling down very sharply so that the opportunity cost of holding money balances was reduced, which meant velocity was falling very sharply as well. And the reason Milton's money supply was growing so rapidly was because the demand for money was rising dramatically and it was not inflationary. It was the exact opposite of being inflationary. Uh, prices came down dramatically under Reagan. Interest rates came down dramatically under Reagan, even though the money supply, Milton Friedman's money supply, grew very rapidly. Follow me, Ed? Yes, I, I do. I, I'm there. Okay, good. One of the things I noticed was that M2 did rise and inflation rose along with it. Yes. So, so there is that relationship that the demand for money creates a higher interest rate or a higher inflation rate. Well, the demand for money creates more money. Uh, the demand for apples creates more apples. The people grow more apple trees. They pick right. their trees cleaner. You know, what do they do? They, you know, and, and that's very natural. If the demand for apples increases, that the quantity would increase in the marketplace. That's perfectly natural in any market I know of. If there were no demand for cars, believe me, there would be a lot less cars in the United States. <laughs> yeah. It's straight. Basically, there are two ways the quantity of a product can increase. One is an increase in the demand for that product. And if the increase in the demand for that product occurs, you'd expect to see the price of that product rise and the quantity of that product rise. All right. If the supply of that product rises, let's say there's a shift in the supply curve, you'd expect to move down the demand curve. You'd see an increase in the quantity of that product and the price of that product would fall. If there's an increase in supply, you have an increase in quantity and a falling price. If there's an increase in demand, you have an increase in the quantity and a rising price. And that's exactly the way it goes out there. And that's why I'm so upset with the Fed trying to control the economy by reducing the demand for goods and services rather mm -hmm. than by increasing the supply of goods and services. Right is the perfect now is the perfect time to have tax cuts, deregulation, pro-growth policies. And they're not doing that. That's the way to tampen inflation down and to create prosperity. But no, no, no. These guys are Keynesians. And all they want to do is crush demand to lower prices. It will lower inflation. It will. But it'll do it at horrible cost. We lowered inflation dramatically during the 80s by increasing the supply of goods and services, by tax cuts, government spending restraint, deregulation, freer trade, strong dollar. All of that occurred in the 80s, creating a huge increase in economic growth and falling prices because we increase the supply of goods and services rather than what these yahoos are doing, which is trying to reduce the demand for goods and services. I hope your reviewers understand that. Uh, yeah. It's really critical. Yeah. And by the way, anybody who has questions for Dr. Laffer, go into the chat feature down below and uh, toss them in there. Um, so in terms of as we get into the presidential cycle, there's going to be a lot of talk about tax policy. Yeah. And there always is since since you know since Reagan, there's always been this discussion of something that you created or invented, I, I'd like to say, is trickle-down economics. And people constantly say trickle-down economics doesn't work, but it, it it does work and it always has worked. Can you address that? Well, you, you just said it. I don't even need to answer your question. It's exactly <laughs> correct. Every time we've raised the highest marginal income tax rate in the United States, you know, this is my book, by the way. I don't know if you have a copy, Ed, but it's called Taxes Have Consequences. It was out five months ago. Just I came will... out. My co-authors are Brian Dimitrovic and Gene Sinkfield, both of them doctors. And it's the complete history of the U.S. income tax from 1913 to the present. And we look specifically at the highest tax rates Every time you've raised the highest marginal income tax rate, the economy is underperformed. Every time you've lowered the highest marginal income tax rate, the economy is outperformed. Every time. Every time you've raised the highest income tax rate, uh, uh, tax revenues from the top 1% of income earners have gone down. 
Every time you've lowered the highest tax rate, tax revenues from the top 1% of income earners has gone up. They stop sheltering their income and they earn more. It's just straight and simple like that. Then you find out that every time you raise tax rates on the rich, the biggest damage has been done to the poor, the lowest echelons and the economic ladder. Uh, because, I mean, the Great Depression was not a good time for low income workers. That's when we raised the highest marginal income tax rate from 25% to 63% on January 1st, 1932. Then we raised it to 79% on January 1st, 1936. We finally got it in uh, 1944 up to 94%. 94%. Yeah, that's what we did. You can wow. see what happened during during uh, Jack Kennedy when he cut the highest tax rate dramatically. We had the go-go 60s. Huge boom in the economy and a huge drop uh, a huge uh, drop in the unemployment rate and budget surpluses and tax revenues from the rich went way up. You can see what happened in the roaring 20s. We dropped the highest rate. Now, think of this. In 1919, 1920, and 1921, the highest marginal income tax rate in those three years was 73%. 73%. Uh, the win election of 1920 put in Harding and Coolidge, who took office in 21. They started cutting the tax rates dramatically. They cut it down to 25%. That period was called the Roaring Twenties. Inflation went way, way down. The unemployment rate dropped to effectively zero. It was an enormous period. of We had 11 years of budget surpluses, Ed. And then we had the Smoot-Hawley tariff in the last quarter of 1929 passed the House and the Senate. And then it was signed into law by Herbert Hoover in 1930. Uh, and of course, that was the crash of all crashes. The unemployment rate went up to 25%. All of these economists, quote unquote, and I say economists because I went to school with all of them. Well, some of them, I was professors of them because now I'm a little bit older. But these economists just don't know straight up from sick them. You know, I don't give a damn what their opinion is. This is about facts, not how you feel, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. And the facts are, I have every single tax return from 1913 to the present. This isn't sampling. This isn't, ooh, 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 let me guess. This isn't hypothesizing or speculating. We have the numbers. We know exactly what happened when they did it. I wish, I, I wish you could get all these other guys in your life to read that book because, frankly, it just gives you all the tax stuff. It goes through every single period. It shows you all the tax shelters, all the tax people used. You know, when you raise tax rates, people look for tax shelter shed. And in fact, shelter every, every person on this right now, I'm going to send you Dr. Laffer's book. I'm going to buy it and send it to you. Well, if you do that, I will do this. If you'll buy them and you want names on them, I'll inscribe them and sign them to every person who gets one from you. That sounds every like a person. Deal. You just tell my office and I'll just reimburse me for the cost and I can get them pretty cheap. All right. And I will sign one dedicated to the person on your group who calls, and I'll put a little, little inscription aside and draw on that little laugh or curve, which is my profile, my tummy wummy. There you okay? go. That sounds like a great I would plan. love to do that. And it tells you what the facts are rather than what some stupid goof at Harvard's opinion is. I well, watched the Jason Furman's lecture where he said the, the highest tax rate, the right one is 73%. What a bunch of acres and acres of soap suds and horse poop. We went from 73% at seven, in three years to down to 25%. Okay, we have budget surpluses and huge increases in tax revenues from the rich. And inflation went way down. Duh. We had a huge increase in the supply of goods and services. Is that a shock for you? So, so let, me, let me ask you this. We have $32 trillion of long-term debt. Yeah, I know. How in the world do we pay this back? There are, there are two sort of strategies right now in the world that we talk about, all right? One is to raise tax rates to get more revenue, and one is to lower tax rates to get more revenue. Let me just tell you that if you went to a low-rate, broad-based, flat tax, static revenue neutral, the type of tax I did for Jerry Brown when he ran for president in 1992, you would increase revenues dramatically, all right? That's the tax answer. That's the tax side of the question. And the other side of the question is government spending. Hello, why are we doing all these stimulus packages and giving debt forgiveness to students and all that stuff? You know, you've got to bring spending way, way down. I don't mean down ooh, little bits. I mean, really get it. We should never have stimulus spending. Stimulus spending hurts the economy, causes slower growth in the economy. If you pay people not to work, and if you tax them, if they do work, 
Do, do I need to say the next sentence to you, Ed? Yep. You're going to get a lot of people not working. We okay. have the lowest participation rate today we've had in generations because we're paying people not to go to work. We're paying people to leave the labor force. We're giving them huge stimulus packages. If I gave you $2 million, free and clear, Ed, here you got it. Boom. What would you do with that money? Well, the first thing you might do is, I think I'm going to go on that cruise I've always wanted to go on. I'm going to quit my job for a while, take a long vacation. I'm going to shout my friends some beer. There's going to be less work from it, and there's going to be stimulus spending, which causes disruptions to the economy. And that's just what we've been doing since the pandemic. We've been giving all these people money. They decide to quit their jobs and sit at home and guzzle beer or go on cruises. And God but, knows how we get them back into the labor force. God knows. But realistically, since we're adding to our, our, our deficit is going up, which is adding to our debt every year. Do you foresee any possibility that we start to cut into this debt? Well, I do, but it's a possibility. It's not a likelihood. I look at the people in government right now. I look at our president. I look at the cabinet members. I look at the Congress. I look at who the Republicans are. I look at who the Democrats are. And it does not fill me with hope, giggles, and glee. Is that fair enough to say to you? Now, yeah. I was not filled with hope, giggles, and glee either under Jimmy Carter. I wasn't. But then all of a sudden, the clouds parted, the sun shone forth on the earth, the fields turned green, uh, the trees blossomed and bore fruit, the animals they multiplied, the, 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 all the kids in the orphanages were adopted, and Ronald Reagan took office, and we had the most wonderful period of, oh, and Reagan with Clinton. Clinton was a great president. I voted for him twice. I've been more Democrat in my life, Ed, than I have been Republican. You probably don't know that. Your viewers don't either. I'm only tax. I'm only economics. And I don't give a damn whether you're Democrat or Republican. If you like tax cuts, I love you. I don't care if you're straight or gay and you like tax cuts, I love you. I don't yeah. care if you're pro-life or anti pro-choice. If you like tax cuts, I love you. I've got a seat in my tent for you. Uh, okay. Everything is solved by economic growth. Economic growth is the greatest freedom provider in the world. There's no freedom more important than the freedom from hunger, than the freedom from want, than the freedom from deprivation. That is the thing. Rich people have less abortions and they adopt more kids than do poor people. Let's make everyone rich and therefore we can solve the social problems. And I could go on and on and on. There's nothing that matches growth. You know, tax cuts, uh, spending restraints, sound money, minimal regulations, free trade, and then get the hell out of the way and let the economy solve it. Now, do I think we're going to have this in the next two years? No. But I've been wrong a lot of times before. And sometimes, you know, you really get surprised by people like John F. Kennedy. He was a, lo a lousy senator. I mean, he, he, he was a slack ass uh, you know, guy going to party. Blah, blah. He became a great, great president. You know, Reagan, who would have guessed the biggest tax increase in Governor California ever had, biggest social spending when he chaired the Equal Rights Amendment. He passed all of the anti-abortion statutes in the state of California. This was the head of the union. He, he increased the capital gains tax rate from 9.2% from, uh, uh, from to 11.2%. Who would guess that guy could be the greatest president we've ever had? He was. He learned from his mistakes. And so I am perfectly open-armed, open-eyed, and open-hearted waiting for the Messiah to come back to America to save us. And I think it has a good chance of happening. I look at all of these candidates out there. Have you seen this guy, Jared Polis from Colorado? He's amazing. Price no, transparency. Know. First governor to put in, Democrat, gay Democrat. First governor to put in price transparency. Wow. I mean, that's amazing. He's cut property taxes. He's cutting, he has to face opponents in both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party because of he wants to cut taxes much more than any of the others. He's just amazing. A Democrat from Colorado, he only won. He was a really close re-election. He only won by 20 percent, the same as DeSantis did. Wow. Just cleaned house. He's the best governor, I think, in the United States today. And he's a Democrat. And God, is he good. And now, I never even so, heard of him. Well, I know. And that's why I'm that's why I'm on your show is to tell you the truth, the beauty, the American way. You know, we have a lot of chances for optimism in this country. And now that Pelosi's out, and I think a lot of the leadership of the Democrats have weakened, you can now get a Democratic Party that 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 will tolerate, if not adore, diversity. And I mean diversity of intellectual opinions, not diversity of height or weight or age or color or gender or 
sexual preferences. Who cares about that stuff? I want diversity of ideas. I want people thinking through and saying, what's the right answer? Not what's my party's color basis or whatever. You know what I'm saying. Absolutely. So, so that brings me to um, diversity of the reserve currency, because there's a lot of discussion. A lot of people are fearful. I just heard today that Nigeria, uh, the president of Nigeria came out and said something about, you know, we shouldn't do any trade with the U.S. dollar. What are the chances and what is the implication of the U.S. dollar not being the reserve currency for the well, world? Well, if we continue to do what we've been doing, the implications are we will lose the dollar uh, as the global currency. But can I take you back again? And just take you into an economics. And I know you profess not to be an economist, but I, I hear you're one clever fella. And I hear you're really good at analyzing markets and getting things right and doing well, and which means you have an innate sense of economics. All right. Well, Prior you. to 1913. Now, that's when they put in the income tax was 1913. In 1913, they also put in the Federal Reserve. That's when the U.S. adopted. That's when the government monopolized money. Prior to 1913, we had private creators of money all over the country. Now, it is true that prior to 1913, uh, the U.S. government defined a dollar as being one ounce of silver and also one twentieth of an ounce of gold. And the, and the government also had minting. So they would mint uh, you know, $20 gold pieces. They'd mint $1 silver dollars. They did all of that. But they didn't control the quantity of money. They didn't control anything. But they did have supervision of banks, and they went around to them. All of the money, minting as well as everything else, was done privately. And we had private banks that issued liabilities on their own banks uh, as currency circulating. And sometimes the currency sold at discounts, and etc. And that was the period that the U.S. became the preeminent power on the planet Earth. We had no inflation whatsoever for literally for centuries. <laughs> Not, I mean, none. All of that happened under private banking. One thing that excites me right now, and remember, I'm way too old to understand it, but I'm, I'm not a computer freak. In fact, can any of your viewers see this? You have a flip phone? I have a flip phone. I do not have a computer and I do not do emails. All right. So, but I love cryptocurrencies. I think this is a way of the private sector pushing the government out of the creation of money and having a private sector money. If we had a private sector money uh, and if we allowed it to go and got the government out of the monopoly of money, I believe that very quickly we would be the dominant currency in the world and we would recontrol all of the everything would be done in dollars and countries like Nigeria, which I know very, very well, by the way, I've had many, many Ibu and Yoruba students and Hausa students, as well, not many Hausa students, but I've known a lot of Hausa. And uh, that country is amazing. Once you provide a good currency, you're going to get their business. And just like everything else, if the dollar is as good as gold, let me tell you, every country will transact in dollars. We have nothing to fear. It's only when we get squirrely Federal Reserve and we get these hyperinflations and stuff, all of that stuff, that's when everyone wants to move off the dollar. And of course they want to move off the dollar. The dollar is the problem, not those countries. So we can make the dollar the international currency by making a good dollar, not by making a lousy one. Well, what would it mean if like, the thought is that China would become the reserve currency? But they're a communist country. I mean, I can't imagine that the world would switch to a to a communist currency. Well, it depends on what the communist government did with their currency, et cetera. But the yuan, as you know, in 1992, the Chinese government pegged the yuan to the U.S. dollar. What they did effectively, Ed, was they outsourced monetary policy to the U.S. Fed. And they had for years and years and years stayed fixed to the U.S. dollar. All right. And this allowed them to have stable prices and very low volatility on, uh, on uh, monetary inflation and all that stuff. And it really was one of the major pillars that allowed them to become as prosperous and as great as they currently are. If the U.S. keeps making a bad currency and the Chinese understood it uh, and made a good currency, they will supplant us. People want a good, sound currency. What you want to do is know that if I make a contract with someone today in dollars, that the value of that dollar is five years, 10 years, 15 and 20 years out will be approximately the same as it is today. So I know what I'm doing in real terms. If you provide an inflation currency that goes squirrely on me, sometimes up a lot, sometimes not, it makes the dollar very hard to make long-term contracts in. 
whether it be for food supplies, whether it be for products, or whether it be for any type of contract whatsoever, including long-term government bonds. So we need to make a sound money. That's critical to prosperity. There's nothing that can bring an economy to its knees faster than an unsound paper currency unbacked. And that's what we've done with the dollar since Smithsonian, by the way. It's been for a long time. Now, Reagan brought it back a lot, all right? But then it went squirrely all again with, you know, the four stooges, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter. And then it went really squirrely under uh, W and Obama and Biden. Trump started getting it back again, but, you know, his term really, his effective term was very short, given the pandemic and what happened. So, so looking ahead, economic challenges over the next decade, what policy changes do you recommend to counteract these challenges? Let, let me put them to you as far as the North Star. The, they're for the five king, grand kingdoms of economics, and I'll just touch on those. Taxation. Okay. The best taxation policy is the lowest possible tax rate on the broadest possible tax base. The reason you want the lowest rate is to provide people with the least incentives to evade, avoid, or otherwise not report taxable income. And you'd want the broadest possible tax base so you provide people with the least loopholes in the tax codes where they could stick their income to avoid paying taxes. So a low rate, broad based flat tax, no deductions, no exemptions, no exclusions, just you pay the same rate on the first dollar to the last dollar, bang. All right? Second, okay. spending restraint. You know, we need government and there is a proper size of government, but this government's way, way, way too large. We need to reduce spending. All right, we need low rate, broad based flat tax, spending restraint, sound money, which we've already talked about. We need to bring the Fed back into creating sound money rather than trying to control the economy. Minimal regulations. We all know we need regulations, Ed. I mean, you can't wake up one morning and drive on the right-hand side of the road the next morning. Oh, I want to drive on the left-hand side. No, we need regulations. But what you don't want to have happen is you don't want those regulations to go beyond the specific purposes at hand and create a lot of collateral damage in the overall system. The regulations on energy day are crazy. Even if you're even if you're not in favor, even if you believe in global warming, they're crazy. There's nothing wrong with us producing uh, uh, carbon product uh, hydrocarbons. It's burning them that's the problem. Uh, you know, and so we need to make sure we deregulate all of this so we become the producers in the world, and then we decide with it. You can decide with a. If you want to, with a, with a carbon tax, to have a, uh, have a way of tilting against carbon in the atmosphere. I don't. Al Gore and I agreed on this policy long ago. We did some work together on it, and I'm not sure whether global warming exists or not. But I'm not a climatologist. But I don't mind a carbon tax as long as you offset it dollar for dollar with an income tax cut. In fact, I'd rather have a carbon tax every day of the week and twice on Sunday than than than, than an income tax if we could knock it down. And that's the regulate. And lastly, you want free trade. And here's where you're going to get your viewers to hate me. But let me, I might as well tell them that you're going to hate me to be in. Let's hear it. Trade is not a political weapon. Trade, trade is for economics. And you should never interfere with free trade to stop an enemy. It's stupid. Sanctions are the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Ever, ever heard. We've had sanctions against Cuba since 1959. You see how well they've worked? Huh? The Cubans now love us, don't they? Oh, America, thank you for showing us the errors of our ways. We love you now so much. Blah, 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 blah. Sanctions don't work. But what they do do is create enemies. We need to have free trade with the Chinese, with, with the Russians, with the Iranians, with the North Koreans. We need free trade so that we become, we're in business with them. We talk with them. We work with them. You know, we solve problems together in a business way. Do you like your customers, Ed? The people, of course you do. And I like my customers. I send them Christmas cards. I send men, tell them a high of boat toot soats on their, on their birthdays. And then I talk with them. And if they're doing something I don't think is right, I talk with them about it. They talk with me about it. And we solve things. That was Reagan. You know, trust but verify. He worked very closely with the Russians. He tried to do it with the Chinese as well. <clears throat> and, you know, so did Nixon try to do it with the Chinese. I was the first American to go to China in 1970. I went with George Schultz and John Ehrlich when I was in charge of Chinese policy in the White House at that time. Were you, Trade were you, is a weapon of love, not of hate. And you, frankly, China's going to be here 50 or 100 years from now and hope to God we are too. Do you want that 50 or 100 years to be years of war or peace or love? Talk to them. They're treating the Uyghurs badly. I agree with that. 
No one wants uh, stealing of, of intellectual property, whether it's Americans stealing American intellectual property, whether it's Americans stealing Chinese intellectual property, or the Chinese stealing American intellectual property, or the Chinese stealing Chinese intellectual property. We should have strong shared uh, stealing of intellectual property laws everywhere, irrespective of the nationality of the person who is doing the stealing or getting stolen from. All of these are broad-based. We should work together to create a prosperous world. We're in this planet with a lot of other countries. And if you want to flip them off, you go ahead, but you're going to bear the consequences. The earth you are scorching is your earth too. These people, the more you put sanctions on them, the more you put trade barriers on them, the more they hate, hate, hate you. If you think North Korea likes us, you're seeing a different planet than I've seen. If you think all of these belligerent actions, both ways, by the way, between China and the U.S. If you think that helps world peace, you're, you're living in a different planet than I am. Uh, you know, you've so, seen, we need free trade with these countries so that we can talk together, work together, do business together, and then try to solve problems together. Don't use sanctions. When I see Hillary Clinton standing there in a mu'u mu'u on a podium saying, I put in stronger sanctions. She doesn't understand straight up from Sikkim. She doesn't know anything about economics, anything about politics in the world. And it's just disgusting watching these people talk about sanctions. I hate China. How can you hate China, for God's sakes? You may not like Xi. You may not like communist governments, but turn them over. China has had the greatest increase of freedom of any country in the world ever from 1970 to the more people have fallen off the rolls of desperate poverty into medium in, median income since 1970 in China than in the entire history of Homo sapiens. They've done a great job of creating prosperity. This is a country we should work with, not hate. End of lecture. But you understand. I, 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 I love it. I, what, what, what gets to me is everything you say, is it's perfect. It's exactly the way I feel, probably because I've learned from you and I've, I've, I've read so much of what you've written and followed you for so many years. But why is it that there are people like Austin Goolsby and people like Austin who are on the Democrat side who don't see things this way. I'm going to tell you, let me answer that question. And I like Austin very much. I think he's a very good economist. I've debated him many times. I've discussed things with him. We get along well. He asked me to come in and do a briefing for Obama when he was chief economist there. So he's pretty open-minded. I think he's a fair guy with a lot of good training. And he is also was a, a chair, was a tenured professor where I was a tenured professor at the University of Chicago. Okay. So okay. Austin, I'm going to use that. I'm not going to use Austin Gillsby as the example, but he is one of them. When you take a job with the government, you are its employee and employees are to do what their bosses ask them to do. That's the obligation of what an employee does. You hire someone to do a job for you. These people will rebut arguments they know to be true in order to curry favors with their political benefactors. Mm -hmm. Ed, I'm going to tell you, I worked in the Nixon administration. I was George Schultz's right-hand person. The guy made a mistake of hiring me five times in his life. He never, he never learned from his past mistakes. But I made a vow to myself at the end of that period of Nixon, all right, that was 72, that I would never take a dollar again from the government, never take pay from a government. All right. I would never take a job with government because it would tilt all of my views of what they're now with Reagan. I never was an employee of Reagan's. I never was an employee of, 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 of uh, any of the presidents then. And I had great influence, as you know, in all of these. I never took a penny from Margaret Thatcher. I never took a penny from uh, Pinochet and Sergio de Castro in Chile. I never took a penny from uh, from from Argentina, from Menem or any of those people. I went down there, offered my advice, and I offered what I thought was right. They couldn't fire me. They couldn't hire me. They couldn't double my pay. They couldn't have my pay. I was speaking what I thought was right. Now, I make enough mistakes on my own, Ed, without being biased by incentives to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I've had more influence in this world not working for governments than I have for working with them. I, I cleaned house under Reagan. All the official economists for Reagan, I won. They lost. You know, and the same thing with Trump and the tax bill, the same. I mean, I work that way. I never take a penny because once you're an employee, you've got to follow what your boss wants you to do. And I'm not willing to do that as this economist. Now, I understand other people doing it, but then 
they should understand it. I see Janet Yellen talking talk the talk she talks and some of the others. And, and I've got to tell you, I don't think she believes that. I, I just don't. I think she's doing what she's told to do. And she convinces herself that the overall big picture, the grand picture is worth making this little mistake. You know, uh, 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 well, how does it say? Uh, on the fair... Uh, on ne fait pas un omelette uh, sans casser des oeufs. You can't make an omelette without breaking a couple of eggs. Uh, <laughs> and uh, on ne serait pas faire un omelette sans casser des oeufs. And, you know, the truth of the matter is they justify their existence on each and every little issue by saying the big picture is much more valuable than my little mistakes. And that is not the way I want to be in this world. I want to be correct on every little issue and every big issue. And if you don't like it, fine. You, you know, don't send me a check. <laughs> well, speak, speaking of that, Dr. Laffer, as we conclude here, because I, I told you it would be about 30 minutes, um, there is a, a 501c3 that um, I want to bring to everyone's attention and ask them to contribute to it. And it's the Laffer Foundation. Laffer Center. The Laffer Center. And, and they can find it by going to Laffer Center. Uh, .org. I think Laffer Center is a .org. It's Laffer Center. Dot, you, as you saw, I had a flip phone. All my office <laughs> knows what it is, but it's the Laffer Center .org. I'd love to have it. Any questions, anything you want. We do good work. We do, pre, uh, we do, we, we do uh, healthcare transparency. Trump gave me all the credit for his executive order on that. Again, not taking a penny from Trump or anything else, but I, I love working when I don't get paid so I can tell the truth as to I, how I see it. All right. And I do make mistakes. Don't, don't right. anyone think, it. but I would love, and this allows me to fund it. I'm working very much with, uh, on all of these major issues and anyone who wants to get in touch with me, I would love it. And thank you very much, Ed, for mentioning that. Um, well, I appreciate it. Book, I'll be making a contribution. Book, by the way, I will sign for any of the people who ask you for it. I will get a collection of all the people you want Just buy the books and I'll send them back to you signed to the person with a little inscription and my sign. And then you can send them out to your clients. Sounds great. Dr. Laffer, it's been a thrill. I, I love talking with you and hopefully we can do it again sometime. Anytime you want to do it, Ed, I would love to do it, please. We've got a lot of other things, enterprise zones, how to help the poor, price care transparency. All of these issues are really, really important. And thank you for allowing me to be on your show and to talk to your clients as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, sir. My pleasure.